All right, chapter 18 is all about aromatic compounds, and aromatic compounds have kind of this odd history. The old definition for something being aromatic was what? Does anybody know? It smelled. It smelled, right? So the old definition... was something that is smelly. So if you smell gasoline, right? Gasoline's got a lot of aromatic compounds in there. Yeah. Some people like the smell of gasoline, other people hate it. Um, however, we realized around the year 1800 or so that we weren't entirely correct with that because oftentimes esters and aldehydes are super smelly too. Um, so for example, later on next term, we're gonna do an, uh, an ester lab where we make a bunch of fruity esters that smell like bananas and strawberries and things like that. So aromatic compounds um, needed to be revised in terms of their definition. And so the modern definition is a little bit more nuanced. The modern definition is that it's a planar ring system with 4n plus 2 pi electrons that are delocalized. And we're going to talk more about this 4n plus 2 rule um, a bit more tomorrow. But the definition is now very well defined, um, and you have to have a planar ring system, and you have to have a certain number of electrons in there. But let's talk a little bit about nomenclature, and we've seen this briefly before. If you've got a mono-substituted ring, we don't really have any special names for it, and we'll go over um, some of the non traditional IUPAC names, some of the holdovers from pre-IUPAC times. However, if you've got a di-substituted ring, there's a bunch of variations, and we talked about this a bit more when we were doing NMR, right? Does anybody remember what this one's called? Para. 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 So this is a para-substituted benzene ring. You can also have rings that are oriented in this manner. What are these called? Meta. Meta. And then, last but not least, we've got our groups that are adjacent to one another. What are these called? Ortho. Ortho. So this, this naming system is used to describe disubstituted rings. Alternatively, if you really want to, you don't have to say para. You can instead say this is a one, two, three, a one, four disubstituted benzene. That's also acceptable. Or in the case of meta, you can say one, two, three. This is a one, three disubstituted ring. Or you can just say it's a one, two disubstituted ring. Either way, it's fine. When you get into tri-substituted, tetra-substituted, or higher, you don't say uh, ortho, meta, or para. You use the numbering system instead because it gets very complicated. And ideally, you want that number one to be your highest priority substituent. And th that follows the IUPAC priority system that we'll talk about in more detail later. So let's go over some of the old IUPAC names. So old fashioned naming. Some of these make absolutely no sense based on the IUPAC rules, but we've gone ahead and accepted them. The first one, if we look at it, most students would say, hey, that's methyl benzene, right? That's what I would say. However, the old fashioned name that's most commonly used is what? Does anybody? Toluene. So you can say toluene or methylbenzene. Most people will say toluene, though. You're missing a name. Oh. <laughs> toluene, there we go. And then the next one, a lot of people would be tempted to say, hey, this is hydroxybenzene. Benzoic acid. No. It's not benzoic acid. Phenol. It's phenol, right? So phenol is used instead of hydroxybenzene. The next one's... Also kind of goofy. This one, most people would say, hey, this is methoxybenzene, right? Not quite. This is called anisole. <laughs> because that makes perfect sense. <laughs> so close. The next one's a little easier. This is benzoic acid. 
That one's a little bit more intuitive. The next one that we have is also fairly intuitive. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. What is this one called? <laughs> Benzaldehyde. The next one is a little bit different. So now we've got a ketone. Does anybody know what this one's called? Benzenone. No. Close. Does anybody remember what this functional group is referred to as? When you've got a methyl ketone? This is an acetate functional group. So in this case, we call this acetophenone. You do have to know all of these. The next one, I am serious, unfortunately. The next one we've talked about briefly when we were covering polymers. This is called styrene. Styrene is a common monomer for making polystyrene, right? That's stuff in packing foam peanuts. And then the last one that's kind of odd is this one, and this is called aniline. All of these re are referred to as parents. So the example I would give is, let's say we've got a chlorine coming off of that anisole. What could we call this? Or yeah, we could call it metachloroanisole or three chloroanisole. So you want to use that as your parent name when you're naming the overall molecule, even if there's more substituents coming off of there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We'll do a few examples, though. But chlorine wouldn't be the higher priority one. No, the parent is the root, and then any substituents are treated um, as the prefix, right? Okay, so let's do a, a good example here. Yes. <laughs> My favorite. All right, so let's try to name this guy. What's the parent? Polyamine. Polyamine, right? Are we going to use ortho and meta para? No. No, it's too complicated to do that. Where do we put the number one at? Yeah, the carbon where the methyl's coming off. Does anybody want to help me out with the name? What do you think? 246-trinitrotoluene. Yeah, exactly. 246-trinitrotoluene. Also known as TNT, right? I'm TNT, I'm dynamite. Which is ironic if you guys listen to that song. Dynamite doesn't have TNT in it. It's weird. Yes. Um, TNT actually has nitroglycerin in there. Um, so I don't know why they said that. Apparently they didn't take Oakham. <laughs> this is TNT. TNT is um, nitrated toluene, and it's actually very easy to make. However, the big pitfall with TNT, does anybody know what it is? Super reactive. You accidentally bump it or hit it, it will explode. Um, so that's why it's been phased out as an explosive, is it's just too harmful to transport, or too hazardous to transport, I should say. Yep. Dynamite, is it, is it still nitroglycerin just in dynamite in the case, or whatever it's called? Is that what yeah, dynamite is nitroglycerin in um, some sort of embedded material, normally diatomaceous earth, so which makes it more stable. stable. It's not okay. TNT. All right, let's do another one. Let's do this one. So let's do it in order, right? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. The parent is going to be what? Styrene. So you do have to remember all of those parent names. I know it takes a little bit of work, but you'd be surprised how quickly you can learn them. 
All right. What will go first in the naming, the bromo or the chloro? Bromo. bromo, right? So you do have to alphabetize them. So this would be two bromo, four chloro, styrene. All right. And so you can see so far when we're talking about aromatic molecules, we're all talking about substituted benzenes. Benzene's the classic aromatic molecule, right? And we've talked about it a lot throughout the year as being the special type of molecule. There are a lot of other aromatic molecules and we'll cover their naming conventions a little later, but for right now, we're gonna stick with just substituted benzenes. So let's discuss what makes benzene in particular so special. So, this is a pretty interesting experiment that was done where you can take cyclohexane and you can convert it to cyclohexane using what conditions? H2 yeah, some sort of catalyst along with hydrogen gas. So you might use like palladium on carbon, for example, and you can reduce that double bond to a single bond. The neat thing is when you do this, you can actually do it in a calorimeter and you can measure how much heat is absorbed or released during this reaction, right? And so they did this and they determined that the delta H naught value for this was about negative 100, or, oh, 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 a negative 120 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so then they tried to do the same thing with benzene. However, you actually have to change your catalysts a little bit and you need three equivalents of hydrogen gas. And normally it's done with a special nickel catalyst. And you have to do this at really high PSI, which is the first clue that something weird is going on. It doesn't work at the pressures that are required for normal alkenes. You have to really ramp up the pressure close to 100 PSI as opposed to just uh, around 15 PSI. Okay, so if you do this, you can reduce an aromatic ring to cyclohexane. And what do you think the anticipated delta H naught was when the people were first looking at this? They probably think it's negative 360. Yeah, negative 360, right? One alkene, multiply it by three. So you'd say expected delta H naught of negative 360 kilojoules per mole. However, when it's measured, Delta H naught for the system is actually negative 208 kilojoules per mole. So what does this mean? This experiment essentially says that there's something special with benzene, some sort of stabilization, and it says that there is approximately 152 kilojoules per mole of stabilization. Yeah, that's a lot. Which means that benzene doesn't do the same reactivity that a normal alkene does, right? So let's take a look at an example. So let's say we have cyclohexene and I react this with Br2. This can do just a normal addition reaction, right? And what's the orientation of the bromine going to be after it adds? Is it gonna be anti? Yeah, exactly. So one bromine's gonna be a dash, one's gonna be a wedge. It's chapter nine stuff. Hopefully you guys haven't forgotten that. Too late? Push something in your brain, something else falls out. If you do the same reaction with bromine, However, you try to do it with benzene, nothing happens. Those pi bonds do not behave like a normal alkene pi bond. Why do you guys think that might be the case? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, they're only partial pi bonds, right? Which gets back to the idea when you don't know the answer, the answer is resonance, right? So let's take a look at what's going on from an orbital picture. So 
So from an orbital view, I'm going to do a kind of a side-on view of benzene. So these two carbons are kind of coming out towards us. And I'm going to make this nice and thick to indicate that there's some perspective going on here. And then the back carbons are kind of pointed away. If you look at this, each of these carbons has whoop, a p orbital. And I'm going to draw the p orbital using different phase colors. When you have all of these orbitals align, all of the electrons in that pi system are actually delocalized through the ring. And a few of you have asked me about this already. Oftentimes, chemists, because they're lazy or they're trying to hurry, they don't draw benzene with alternating double single bonds. Instead, what they do is they draw a hexagon with a circle in it to indicate that these aren't true pi bonds, they're not true single bonds. They're actually kind of in between, and there's a huge amount of electron delocalization occurring within these molecules. This is also true for other aromatic molecules that aren't benzene. So another example, might be pyridine. So let's take a look at pyridine really quick. Pyridine's that non-nucleophilic base that we sometimes use. Right? If we look at pyridine, that nitrogen's got a lone pair, and we said that that nitrogen lone pair is actually pretty good at being a base, right? So if you think about this using that same molecular orbital view that we were previously using, oh, sorry, this should be in nitrogen. We've got these p orbitals on all of these atoms, including the nitrogen. And then down here, we've got the other phase of those p orbitals. OK. So if we look at this, we've got electron delocalization occurring in this ring system up here, right? Where's the lone pair? What sort of orbital is the lone pair in? Yeah, exactly. If we think about it, right, that pi bond's already occupied by two electrons, which means the lone pair can't be in this delocalized system. But the hybridization of the nitrogen's what? If we look at this nitrogen, is it sp, sp2, sp3? sp2, which means we have another sp2 orbital. This sp2 orbital is hanging out over here, and these electrons are just kind of hanging out on their own in this and, or this p orbital stick, or sorry, sp2 orbital sticking out into space. That's what makes this such a special base, is its lone pair can't delocalize. It's just kind of hanging out there. Meanwhile, you've got this current of electrons going on above and below the ring system. So what we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to talk more about that 4n plus 2 rule and discuss what makes a molecule aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic, and how to predict that. Hello.